Welcome to another edition of the Georgia Manufacturing Alliance Manufacturing News Network podcast. Lloyd, today we've got a great call lined up. Uh, today we're going to be doing a member spotlight of a good friend and sponsor of GMA, longtime friend, Mr. Russ Dunlap. He represents Taylor English, and, and Russ is a partner with Taylor English, and Russ specializes in patents and intellectual intellectual property strategy. And so we're really excited about having Russ on, online with us today. Uh, give you a little bit of an overview of the goal for the call today. Today's call, we're going to be talking about intellectual property. We want to make sure that you walk away with some knowledge that you uh, might not have before you got on this call but and, and polish up some of the, uh, the ideas or the misconceptions that are tied around intellectual property. So we're going to be talking about the differences between patents, trademarks, copyrights and trade secrets. We're also going to be digging in to clarify some of the legal um, rights concerning intellectual property in the U.S. plus how that impacts you uh, internationally. And then we're going to talk about some of the tips, you know, for, for manufacturers and service providers to identify and protect their technology and their competitive advantage. We're going to get all of that done as well as get to know our good friend Russ a little bit more and in about 28 minutes. So, uh, we got a plate full. No pressure. Excited about getting this thing kicked off. And uh, so while we do that, although I, I've grown to know you pretty well, I'd love for you to share just a little bit about your background. Russ. I'd like you to tell us, you know, where are you from originally? And tell me a little bit about, it looks like you got an interesting layout there for your Zoom office. Tell me a little bit about what's going on in your world. So tell us about Russ. Yep, I'm uh, broadcasting live from my basement where I've been since March, um, <laughs> uh, where most of the attorneys uh, at my firm have been uh, working from home. Um, although recently we've been allowed to go back into the office, I think a lot of attorneys have been going back into the office. Um, mm -hmm. But we have a great remote program set up, uh, great IT support, so uh, we're all pretty much easily able to work from home. Um, even before you know March, when all this happened, all the shutdowns happened. Um, we had a, a we'd already launched a, a full remote attorney program so we have attorneys working remotely all across the country okay. um, California New York Chicago Raleigh just all over the place mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so a little bit about me um, I grew up in Louisville Kentucky um, near my grandfather's farm um, you know moved to the suburbs of Tennessee when I was 10 years old so it's, it's hard to say sometimes I say I grew up in Kentucky. Sometimes I say I grew up in Tennessee. It's right. it's a little bit of both. Um, I moved to Nashville when I was ten. Um, went to the University of Tennessee, as you can see over here. Yeah, uh, yeah. Got my mechanical engineering degree and um, met my wife there. We got engaged in college, and um, she grew up here, so we came down here. Okay. After we got uh, after we graduated and got married, um, she works for Coca Cola. She's been with them her whole career. Okay. Uh, and I came down here. I went to law school at Georgia State. Um, so last year was very interesting. Uh, the Georgia State Tennessee game. I don't know if any of you recall that. That was a. It was weird because uh, right. you know, my alma mater beat my alma mater, and, right. yeah. <laughs> and, and my alma mater, alma mater wasn't supposed to be my other alma mater. Right. <laughs> um, I can I can talk football, you know, for for the next All thirty. Right. So I'll try not to do that. And then uh, while I was in law school was, uh, you know, 2008 to 2011. It was not a great time for the market. Um, but I uh, took the patent bar exam while I was in law school. It's the special bar that you can take if you're, uh, if you have a certain technical background, you can take it before you even graduate from law school. Okay. And I took that. And then um, an attorney I met while I was in law school, he was a Georgia State graduate as well, Jeff Keister. Uh, he came to the school and started asking around, does anybody want to work part-time as a patent agent while they're in law school? And I said, absolutely. Yeah, uh, so I mean. jumped to that opportunity. He was looking for a mechanical engineer and I started working during my third year of law school and, at Taylor English. And then um, after I graduated, I got a full-time offer and I've, I've been here ever since, since 2011. Uh, it's Fantastic. been a great firm to work with. Uh, you know, even in the middle of 2008 to 2011, it was, the fastest growing law firm in the state of Georgia. Um, yeah. I think it was founded in, I believe, 2005 with five attorneys. And by the time mm -hmm. I joined, it was up to 80. And now we're at about, uh, I think, 180 now, something like that, um, awesome. including our remote attorney program. It's been a great model to work with. 
Um, we have a lot of really, really talented attorneys and our model really pushes value to our clients in a way that a lot of firms can't do. So, uh, one of the things that practicing patents ever since. Yeah. And that's one of the things I really love about, uh, about the structure. It's different than a lot of, a lot of other firms you've got access to, you know, um, a, a wide variety. You don't have 180 patent attorneys, right? No. <laughs> that'd be, that'd be way too nerdy. Right. <laughs> no, we have we have uh, attorneys all over the all over the place, all over the uh, practice areas. Um, okay. we started out as a labor and employment firm with a you know three or four labor and employment attorneys, mm -hmm. um, but we have you know have a huge corporate group, huge litigation group, um, taxes, bankruptcy. Um, we have we have a an attorney that just started you know uh, a practice centered around the the growing cannabis practice here in, in Georgia, you know, the yeah. cannabis industry now that the medical marijuana bills have been passed. I mean, okay. you name it, any, any small mid-sized firm startups, uh, if they have a need, we pretty much can meet that need in, in some way, or, you know, obviously I can't, but if you come to me and say, Hey, I have, I have this problem I need help with. I, I will almost certainly know an attorney that can help you or know an attorney at the firm that knows another attorney at the firm that can help you. Can uh, that. Now that we've gotten as big as we are, it's hard to know all the attorneys, but, um, but we'd still do a pretty good job of getting to know each other. Um, so, you know, it, and we've discovered over the last couple of years, the manufacturers are our biggest client base by far. Um, so, you know, our firm has kind of been built around, okay, what do manufacturers need? Um, let's, let's make sure we have attorneys that can cover that. And these are really talented attorneys with a lot of years of experience. Um, a lot of them, most of them started at very big law firms and they just, they have the talent and the experience of a big law firm, but they just got burnt out on that culture and came to Taylor English to build their own practice. So you get that knowledge base that, that you would by hiring, you know, one of the biggest law firms in the country, but you know, you get it, the value that we offer. Yeah. That's the, that's a cool well, piece. I've, I've been fortunate enough to meet a lot of the attorneys at Taylor English and, and it is a different vibe, man. I mean, it's, it's cool because it's like, you know, I mean, heck, it's, how many lawyers do you go out and have a beer with, right? And so far, pretty much all our Taylor English folks, not that all of them are drinkers or anything. I'm not saying that, but, but I'm just saying, these are folks that are just, you know, people that you can engage with and it's a different mindset, which, which I love. And, and I've pitched a couple ideas or questions to you, and and every time I've got the right answer, and I'm really thrilled to be able to do that. And, and I know that there's some fun stuff, some really exciting announcements that we're going to address at the very end of this call. So make sure that you stay all the way to the end of this call, and we're going to roll out some some cool stuff that's going on at, at Taylor English with the community that I know will have a positive impact on the manufacturing community in the state of Georgia. But before we get to that, let's dig in now, and let's talk a little bit about intellectual property is sort of a, a big scope. Tell us, um, there, there, for me, I get, I get way more questions about this uh, than I have any way to answer. So people, there's, there's some confusion. So, so what is, we're, we're in the process of writing a book. Actually, we're writing two. And so, so there's copyright, there's trademarks, there's patents, there's, you know, um, uh, a variety of different things that you can have legal control, ownership, and direct. Can you give us a, a breakdown kind of in, in those big buckets, what they are and, and where do they apply and, and when do you need to engage somebody to help make sure that you got the right strategies? Sure, absolutely. So to start at the very beginning, uh, okay. when, you know, what is intellectual property? You've got property is a, a lot of things. You have, you know, personal property, the things you own. You also have real estate, real property is land. And then the third major category is intellectual property. That's sort of everything involved uh, that comes from here. Your ideas, um, know-how, um, the products that come from those ideas as well. That's sort of intellectual property. It's four main categories, patents, trademarks, copyrights, and then trade secrets. So. I can save the patents for last since that's my specialty, but the other ones, you know, trademarks is your branding. What are the names that you're selling and logos you're selling your products and services under? Um, you know, the, na the name of your company could be a trademark depending on how you're using it to sell products. Um, you know, any logos that you put on the products, things like that. Um, copyrights are 
you know, works of expression that include, like you said, the books you're working on, but it also, um, from the manufacturer's standpoint, copyrights are very important for like your websites, your, uh, your code. If you have software code that you use to do certain things that kind of differentiates you from other companies, um, that can be copyrighted. It can be protectable in that way so that somebody doesn't steal your code. Um, another thing that comes up is your product manuals. Um, either that you, you know, send off with your products to consumers or to other companies on how to build things. Um, for example, uh, a couple years back, I worked with somebody who he sold motorcycle custom kits for the exterior of a motorcycle and, and his all his parts were sort of over the counter. Yeah, you can, but it, how it went together was what was important to him. So um, he had an instruction manual and somebody started copying the instruction manual and posting it uh, and selling it themselves. Okay. So the, the protection that he had wasn't really in like the little fasteners that he had, which were all over the counter, you know, standard stock stuff, but it was in um, the manual itself. You, you know, he had a copyright in that. So if you copy that manual and sell it yourself, you're violating his copyright. Um, so, so, so the, let's back up. So trademarks would be like the Coca-Cola brand. Sir. Because yep. Red, right? So you and 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 then and then the copyright would be, let's just say that the recipe book for the Coca Cola. Yes, if if they're selling the recipe, um, or, or selling something about it, like all the all the books that they sell. Okay. So that that's an important distinction too. Is for trademarks, you can even trademark a color. You know, Home Depot, UPS, they all have trademarks in orange and brown, and Coca Cola is red. Um, okay. Tennessee is orange. Mm -hmm. uh, things like that. It's it's all. Uh, trademark. Yeah, so that's what in there, yeah. <laughs> I got to plug them. Uh, so those are the, you know, the first two categories and the third category that I mentioned is trade secrets. And that's kind of an umbrella term for everything else. that's not patents, trademarks, uh, copyrights. It's, it's really the stuff you don't want other, your competitors to know, uh, okay. whether it be, you know, Coca-Cola secret recipe, obviously that's, that's like the quintessential, trade secret but there's also for example um your customer lists are trade secrets how how do you protect those and keep for example one of your employees gets disgruntled and decides to leave and when he does he takes the customer list and he starts trying mm -hmm. to go out and call up all your customers and and pull them to his new business right. uh, any of your know-how it's it's just all in the in the know-how you know mm -hmm. that your employees your engineers, your technical people have. Um, sometimes it's stuff that you're not aware of. And, and But if you actually kind of started talking around to your employees, you realize, oh, we have a lot of know-how. You know, the, the question is, how do we protect it? How do we catalog it? In the last few years, the uh, federal government has passed some, some uh, uh, one specific statute uh, in particular that is uh, kind of increased the federal trade secret uh, protections so that if you catalog it in a certain way, you protect it in a certain way, then you can use the federal law to enforce your trade secrets if somebody decides to, you know, come steal from you okay. that, that know-how and publish it or take it somewhere else. Okay. So the final category is patents. Um, that's my specialty for the most part. I can advise in all the other areas enough at, at a basic level and if things get complicated I usually go to one of my colleagues at Taylor English um, to, to get additional advice if, you know, if things get too complicated for my base base knowledge mm -hmm. but in the area of patents um, especially in mechanical engineering type patents that's that's my background that's my specialty my bread and butter um, I've been from the very beginning doing patents that are basically mechanical focused on products mm -hmm. and methods of manufacturing. Um, so, so the patents cover just any sort of new useful ideas that you have. Uh, and like I said, your product itself, does it do something new? Does it provide some sort of new uh, functionality that, that no other product has provided before? Or we've come up with a new way to manufacture. Um, the, the method we're using is not really something that we can keep secret. So, you know, the patent would be the better thing to protect it. It's, it's how we protect our market advantage. That's okay. another way to kind of categorize intellectual property. It, it's all those things that give you a market advantage over, mm -hmm. you know, other, over your competitors. Now, so, different, 
types of patents too, right? There's like a design patent and then right. Yes, yes, there's, so that, that was the next category. There's the utility patents are, are what I just kind of described. It's the useful uh, inventions that provide functionality, provide a benefit to other people, to your uh, consumers, customers, things like that. Or there's, if your product just looks cool, it just has a unique look to it that's different than what's already out there. And you want to sort of protect just the look of it, you know, design patent is, is how you would protect that. Um, okay. Design patents are a little bit simpler and easier, but they're also very valuable in that, you know, the, your competitors can, if they try and copy you and they make something that looks kind of like it, but not the same, uh, th there's wiggle room in those design patents that let you say, okay, it's substantially similar. So, in our opinion, they're still infringing our patent. And the competitor really doesn't know until it goes in front of a court, you know, how close they have to, they have to be to actually infringe your patent. Right. So there's a lot of value in, in design patents if you have a unique looking product. And the design patent kind of overlaps a little bit with, um, with trademarks as well, because you can protect what your product looks like or the packaging for the product uh, with trademarks as well. Okay, very cool, very cool. Uh, so I've heard a variety of different um, philosophies around patents. And, and when do you need one? When should you get one? There's like this window of a patent applied for or, or patent pending, right? So tell us a little bit about kind of how that works. And what's the, what's the I've, got a, I've got a genius idea. I've come up with this, this you know, uh, great concept. I hadn't manufactured it yet. Where where does that fit in the process? When do we need to start uh, having that discussion about? A, a, does it need to be a final product? Does it need to be a, a concept? And where does that where does it kick in? So the sooner you start talking to an attorney, a patent attorney, the better. Uh, okay. Really, because you, you don't have to build a final product to get a patent. Okay. As long as you have the concept in your head and you can describe it kind of fully, even if it's at the very early stages, mm -hmm. you can still file for a patent to protect it. Um, there's different ways to do it. You can file a full utility patent application. And you know, at, at that point, as soon as it's filed, it is patent pending. You can tell people you're patent pending. You can't enforce the patent yet, but you can uh, threaten people with it and you can label your product in the website that this product sold on all your pack, all your uh, materials. You can say it's patent pending, uh, including, you know, if you have a, a, a process too, you can sort of label the product that's made by that patent pending process. Mm -hmm. um, you can label it uh, patent pending as well in certain circumstances. So that just kind of lets the world know that yes, you were serious about protecting your intellectual property rights. Right. And, you know, once that patent issues, then you can go after them. And the nice thing about, you know, being able to say patent pending is, uh, at least for the first part of that, in most situations, they can't look at the patent application. They don't know, you know, oh, what really? you have patent pending until that application publishes. And that usually takes at least a year and a half. So oh, okay. you can have a okay. patent pending, um, you know, well, before you put the product to market and people you know, when the product goes to market, they can't even often see what you have in your patent application for at least a little while. Um, so they don't even know what, what you're protecting. So it, it yeah. gives you a, a good sense of, uh, you know, mm -hmm. strength in that. Yeah, no, nobody knows what I'm doing. Nobody knows what I'm patenting. So you know, they can't just immediately knock me off and just, you know, mm -hmm. know exactly how to get around my patent. Right. And that's the, that's the thing is once it goes live, you've got designs, diagrams, exactly what it is that you're doing and how the piece, you know, how it all works. Right. And that way you kind of peel back the kimono and you've shown this is, this is what makes it different. So that maybe those that are um, unscrupulous folks out there trying to figure out a way to rip something off, they can use that content to try to figure out ways around it. Right, but yes, the pending process. You said that can that can take up to about a year and a half or so before before it publishes. Okay, and you can even request it not to be published, although that's kind of getting in the weeds a little bit. But yeah. there, there's ways that for it not to publish, and uh, you know the main thing is, do you want to protect this outside the U.S. or not? 
Um, sometimes publication also kind of helps too because uh, now you've got the product in the market and people start copying you and it's published. Um, now you can actually send the patent application to them and say, look, you're infringing my patent application. If we get a patent, then we're coming after you. And that actually kind of there it has the potential to help when uh, you sue somebody, you win the lawsuit, and now you have the potential to calculate your damages all the way back to when you told them about the patent application. So right. it does give another added incentive there. Mm -hmm. On the flip side, if you are you know a manufacturer and you want to build a product, you want to enter a space, there does have there does come you know the the risk that okay are we infringing another company's patents. Uh, they're selling this product. It's listed as patent pending, or, or it might even say patented. Uh, you want to enlist a patent attorney to at least look at those uh, patent claims and see, okay, am I clear or not? Or what right. times it's what minor thing can I do differently? Mm -hmm. You know, can I connect these two pieces with, um, you know, uh, a bolt instead of a, you know, a, a press fit connection or something like that. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and that might get you around the patent and you don't have to worry anymore. Right. So, so you have to consider it from both angles too. A lot of mm -hmm. times, especially for manufacturers, you're always innovating. You're always trying to come up with, okay, what new space can we move into? What markets are there that we can identify and, and pursue? And um, you need to be aware of the landscape you're entering into, especially from the intellectual property side. And you, you touched on, you know, whether you're going to be doing this in the United States or internationally, right? So the patent, the, the patent office, the U.S. Patent Office is for the, the United States, right? And the United States. So it starts out, the, you can actually use the United States Patent Office to start the process of protecting outside of the United States. Okay. There are, uh, so you file your application in the United States. Um, Per the treaties that the United States has signed with other countries, you typically have a year to pursue protection outside the United States okay. in most countries. So they have um, they signed a treaty called the Patent Cooperation Treaty with most countries. And what that means, it's called we use that term uh, abbreviated to PCT. And generally, what you do to protect outside the U.S. is you file a PCT application. Unless you know exactly what country you want to protect in and say, you come to us and say, well, you know, I, I, I only want U.S. and Canada. That's it. Um, then, yeah, we could just, just go file straight in Canada within that year time period. But if you don't know, and most times you don't know, you know, it, maybe, maybe I'll have a good European market. Maybe I want to protect it in China because I'm going to uh, partner with a Chinese manufacturer for some, for some of my components or something like that. Right. Um, you can file a PCT application, and that is basically just a placeholder application. You can file it in the U.S., and within two and a half years from the first day that you file the patent application. So if you file, you file your U.S. application first, and then six months later you file the PCT application. You have two and a half years from that U.S. application uh, to to pick what countries you want. It gives you a lot of time to figure out. Okay, these are the markets I'm interested in. Um, so, so at that time you can say, okay, I want Europe, I want um, Israel, I want South Africa, Brazil. Um, the PCT is, there's a few countries that aren't sign signatories to the PCT treaty, like uh, North Korea, Iran, uh, Pakistan, you know, th those markets aren't open to you with the PCT route. Um, the biggest one though would be uh, Taiwan. Uh, there's some politics at, at play there. But uh, you can still file a patent application in Taiwan, but you can't go the PCT route. Um, so the, there's there's a lot of interesting complications with protecting outside the U.S. Um, and that kind of leads me into another important thing is that uh, if you start selling your product or you start publishing ideas about your product to the general public or even talking to some of your distributors or your customers, um, about this new patent product you you have this new idea, and you haven't had a patent application filed yet, that could raise some problems. In the U.S. and a few other countries like Canada, Mexico, Australia, um, you have what's called a grace period. And okay, you publicly disclosed this idea, you've got it on sale. You still have one year to file it in the U.S. That's very very important. 
and it's very fact intensive too. You know, how many people have you told? Were they under a non-disclosure agreement? Um, if it's just within your company, obviously that's fine. Uh, outside the U.S., it becomes a little complicated because places like Europe and China, Japan, and most other countries, if you file outside the, if you publicly disclose this idea before you file any patent application anywhere, then that's it. You can't get a patent on it. You cannot get a patent application on it. Really? So if if that's huh. uh, if there's one thing you take from this discussion is that, you know, if I'm going to publicly disclose this idea to anybody outside my own company that's not under a non-disclosure agreement, I really need to, you know, consider whether or not I need to get a patent on file before I start doing that. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. So none of the other countries or most of the other countries don't accept that one year grace period. The U.S. does. So if you've got a great idea and you getting ready to roll it out, you better have it covered or it, it's fair game, right? For you yes. to copy and duplicate. Yeah, in that, in that country. So, yeah, it's something. It's a very important thing that a lot of people don't think about when they come up with a new idea. They're like, oh, well, we'll just start selling it, and if it if it sells well, then we'll consider it a patent. But um, for a lot of places, that that can uh, that can make things difficult. And not only that, but if you start selling it in the U.S., now people know about it. Um, you might have a competitor say, hey, that's a cool idea. Um, you know, they're not saying patent pending. Let's just say that we came up with it and we file a patent application on it. Now that's not a, you know, that that's not a good faith act. It's pretty unreasonable and pretty, uh, pretty bad faith, I guess is, is the way to put it. But that all of a sudden puts it on you to prove that yes, you came up with it and they just copied you. Um, mm -hmm. that, that starts, you know, now legally you have priority because you came up with it first and they stole your idea. They didn't invent it. They have, to, to file an application, you have to be the inventor. You have to be the inventor or have an assignment from the inventor. Um, and if they didn't invent it, then you know they can't file a patent application for an idea they didn't invent. Um, so, but you have to prove that. You have to say, well, okay, they have their own engineers, but they obviously saw this product on a website and then filed for it three days later. You know, now, now we got to prove in court that they stole our idea. So it's just better to to start it off the right way. If you got a great idea, engage with somebody to figure out what your strategy is to protect your intellectual property. Mm -hmm. That just makes sense. Perfect. Dude, this has been awesome. I could talk to you all big data dump. Um, but we gotta go, we gotta drop off here pretty quick. But I did wanna I, I did want to ask you about uh, some of the new things that are going on at, at Taylor English. Tell us about some of the some of the new uh, pieces that, that that are so exciting. Sure. Uh, one of the things we're working on, I, I'm not sure if it's actually technically been announced yet, but I can give a little preview of it here, uh, mm -hmm. is we're working on a fractional general, general counsel program. Um, what that means is, you know, if you're a small company, midsize, you, or a startup, and you don't really, you're not big enough to pay for a full-time in-house general counsel attorney to work for you, um, you know, what, but you need an attorney that can kind of deal with all the issues, work with your distributors or contracts and stuff like that. Um, you know, we are announce, we are about to announce a, a general counsel program that, uh, you know, you basically hire an attorney, uh, one of our attorneys, and he would, he or she would act as your general counsel. It's called outside general counsel. And it's just building up a network of of general counsels at our firm that, that are capable of just taking whatever problems you have and running with them. Uh, okay. One of the things I didn't mention about the firm is that we have a lot of attorneys that come from big, big law firms. Right. There's a lot of attorneys as well that work for in-house, uh, work in-house at big companies. Okay. Uh, we have, uh, Alan Nelson is the one leading the program. Um, I believe he was in-house counsel for, I think, Print Pack um, and some other big companies. Um, you know, we have Gray McCallie, who uh, was in-house counsel for um, Coca-Cola for a while. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, for example, Robert Johnson, another friend of mine, he was in-house counsel for McDonald's for years. So uh, we have a wealth of experience of our in-house counsel group. And they, uh, they know how to handle just about any sort of weird little issue that that you know, small mid-sized companies 
uh, across the board come up with. And you know, if they can't answer the question, then they know who to talk to. Yeah. Well, speaking of who to talk to. Um, one of the things we always like to do is, as we, as we wrap these things up, there's a couple pieces. One is I want to make sure that people know how to get a hold of you, and, and I think probably the easiest way is through LinkedIn, right? That's probably yes. uh, an easy way. You can always go to the Georgia Manufacturing Alliance page and uh, uh, under the uh, online directory and look up Taylor Image, or you can even type in Russell uh, in the search and you can get Russell pop up. Pretty cool that way. But, uh, but uh, we all use social media pretty heavy, and LinkedIn's a great platform. Um, and the other piece is, is I always like to know, I know we've got some people that are online that are listening live, but also we've got a lot of folks that are listening through, uh, through the Manufacturing News Network podcast. And uh, a lot of members are saying, well, how can I do that? What's this member spotlight thing all about? What has been your experience? What's, what's your favorite part about today? What's been your experience in the, in the m and the spotlight piece today? Um, that's a good question. Uh, I love getting in the weeds on patent issues. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> I, can, I can talk about this stuff for hours. It, this 30 minutes went by so quickly. Dude, it's like, um, it's and I, I feel like I could drop a whole, you know, another hour of, of knowledge <laughs> on patents, that patent issues and intellectual uh, property issues that the manufacturers mm -hmm. can can face. Um, but I do love just educating uh, people on intellectual property issues. Uh, I, I feel like, you know, I can, I can kind of break it down for uh, my clients and the very easy to digest pieces without using too much crazy legal terminal terminology. Right, right, right. That's the piece that I love this is, is like, it's, this is understandable. It's foundational knowledge that if you got it, I mean, I know I've taken two or three things away and I thought I was, you know, kind of prepared for this call. Not that I had any great insight but i'm like i've been around this space for a while and there's several things that i had was unaware of you know especially that one year uh grace period in the u.s I, I knew about that piece but i didn't understand how that impacted you internationally but, wow man, that's that's a big deal so um man it has been it has been fantastic i really do appreciate your time today and sharing the knowledge that you've given us today and um uh we're getting ready to make sure that if you're not subscribed to the Manufacturing News Network, you can go online. Just You can just type it in. We've actually got a website set up, manufacturingnewsnetwork.com. And then you can subscribe to the podcast wherever you listen to podcasts, whether it be on Apple or Spotify or Stitcher. You know, there's, there's a bazillion different channels that we're listed on. But make sure you subscribe. And if you found the information today valuable for you and your business or if you know somebody that that would really be able to benefit from uh, the, the information that we shared today, be sure to pass this along to them. Um, uh, you will be able to find all this information on our website as well. We're archiving the video from today as well as some, uh, some additional information on our website. If you go to Georgia Manufacturing Alliance and then under the news section, click on Manufacturing News Network. And uh, that'll give you a link to this video some additional documentation and support material, connections directly with Russ. And um, uh, again, really do, I really do appreciate your time today, the information you've shared with us. It's been another great day at GMA. And with that, we're going to sign off. You guys have a great day. Take care. Thanks, Jason.